In this video tutorial, we're going to introduce the topic of allotropy and we're going to look at the different allotropes of different materials. Now, a useful starting point for this is to look at the allotropes of carbon. And all we mean by an allotrope is different structures, different crystalline structures of a material. And carbon is a good place to start because there's actually eight allotropes of carbon. There's eight different structures of carbon. So just before we look at some of these, I just want to credit this resource or this image to Lumen Learning. So I found this information and these images through Google and some of the information on Lumen Learning about the allotropes of carbon is exceptional. So in terms of the allotropes of carbon, we see eight different examples here, but we're going to focus specifically on A and B as these are the most common or the most familiar forms of carbon. Structure A that we see there is diamond and structure B we see there is graphite. Some of the less common forms, we have C which is Lonsdaleite. We have D, which is actually called Buckminster Fullerine. We have E and F, which are C540 and C70. Again, just different types of carbon. We have G, which is actually amorphous carbon. Amorphous being irregular, as we've seen previously. And H, which is a single-walled carbon nanotube. We do also see this in B for graphite, where each layer is called graphene. So what this image serves to highlight is that carbon is very versatile. It can form lots of different structures or what we term allotropes. So let's look at diamond and graphite in more detail and relate this to some of the things we know about the structures of materials and how that influences the properties of the material. So pictured on the screen here, we have the structures of diamond and graphite. And on the left hand side, we have the structure of diamond, which is a tetrahedral structure. And on the right, we have the structure of graphite, which is a hexagonal structure. Let's focus first of all on diamond. And what we're going to focus on is the central atom here. Now, what we notice when we look at that central atom is that it's actually bonded to four other carbon atoms. Now, we know that carbon has four electrons in its outer shell, but it doesn't want to give those electrons up. Instead, what it wants to do is share each electron with a neighboring carbon. So in this bond here, each of the carbons contributes an electron. In this bond here, each of the carbons contributes an electron, and so on around that structure. Now what that means is that the carbon in the center is now very stable because it has eight electrons in its outer shell. Now each of these other carbons is going to go on and form a similar arrangement. So if we take this carbon here, then that carbon already has two carbon bonds, but it will go on and create another two carbon bonds to satisfy the outer shell and make it stable. Our carbon bottom center here already has three carbon bonds, but it will produce a fourth carbon bond to be stable and so on. And this structure is referred to as tetrahedral as it resembles triangular base pyramids. So what we end up with in diamond is a regular structure but also a huge covalent network where all of the atoms in that network are stable. Let's move on and look at graphite for comparison. And graphite has a hexagonal layered structure. And I've pictured one carbon at the center of one of those nodes. And what we can see is that that carbon now produces three covalent bonds. Well, bear in mind, this carbon at the center had four electrons of its own. One, it shares with this carbon one it shares with this carbon and one it shares with this carbon meaning it has an electron left over now that's going to be true for all of the carbons in that layer or in that structure and we'll look at the implications of that in a moment if we look at our layer at the bottom we end up with exactly the same arrangement where each carbon only bonds to three other carbons and we end up with a free electron now in between those two layers what we end up with is weak intermolecular forces, and we've seen these in a previous tutorial. So let's consider how these two materials differ. On the right hand side we have graphite, which is made up of layers, and those layers can easily slide over one another. So as you would expect, graphite is a much softer material and it's much more easy to deform. It's much easier to disrupt the structure of graphite. Diamond on the other hand has a large covalent network and it's very, very difficult to disrupt that structure. 
So what we end up with is a very hard material. In fact, it's such a hard material, it's often used to enhance cutting tools and drill bits and so on. So it has some very important properties. The other thing that's worth considering is whether each of these conducts electricity. Now diamond won't conduct electricity, it has no free electrons, whereas the graphite has these delocalized electrons. And these delocalized electrons are free to move throughout the material. Therefore, graphite is actually a conductor of electricity. So here we see two different examples of the same material, they're both carbon, but we have two different allotropes. We have diamond and we have graphite. And those different allotropes exhibit different properties as a result of the structure of the material. So it's important to point out that each of these will form under different conditions, but once formed, the different allotropes of carbon have different properties to each other.